So good afternoon or good morning. We are uh, setting up a, um, a YouTube live today. It's a little bit early and uh, apologize for changing the, uh, the time frame. I've got a, uh, an 1130 meeting with uh, some folks in the government to talk about our, um, our uh, program for, for providing um, coronavirus testing. Um, we mentioned that uh, last, last week or, or actually on Monday. Today, the uh, video is going to cover several, a couple of new items and some updates on some old items. Uh, social versus physical distancing or isolation. Reinfection, is that really happening? Then looking down the road, you know, what's going to happen over the next three months in terms of isolation and pandemic uh, management? And then we'll have some updates on ACE inhibitors. Should we change on ACE inhibitors? In-home medical care during uh, social isolation. Uh, virus testing, other national re uh, retailer and reference lab, what I just mentioned a minute ago. Chloroquine versus hydrochloroquine and, and the chloroquines uh, in general. And zinc. So here we go. Uh, first, a, a comment from a viewer, again, a little bit of humor. He said, I was going to try to get down to my original weight, but my wife convinced me that seven pounds and nine ounces was too light for me right now. That was from Reverend Rusty. Thank you, Reverend. We appreciate a little bit of humor, especially uh, at a time when many of us are not eating uh, maybe what we want anyway. So thank you for uh, your tolerance of a little lightheartedness. <clears throat> Social versus physical distancing. I've had uh, a couple of uh, viewers say, will you please clarify that we're not talking about social distancing here? It's a really good point. It's an unfortunate selection of, the, uh, of a term. We're really talking about physical distancing. What we don't want to be doing is uh, breathing each other's air and standing within six feet of each other. Um, as you see, when the president was making his uh, announcement of uh, declaring an emergency, they were all standing clearly within six feet of each other, um, probably breathing each other's air and and uh, touching microphones. And there was a whole bunch of grief that happened as a result of all of that. Bottom line is we're all learning. We're all getting, uh, getting done what we need to do, or at least we're all getting some encouragement to not share this virus. Uh, at least they were outdoors, which, uh, which is helpful. Now, so again, we're not talking about uh, the social aspects of, of distancing here. We're talking about, uh, as you can, you can see with this couple, for example, they're actually showing, they're very close and showing some significant um, uh, social interaction. It's just that they're um, not spreading the virus. I'm not, uh, um, the presentation is showing. I'm sorry, it's not, none of this is showing, Carl? I uh, know. Okay, thank you very much for letting me know. Uh, let's go back. Pardon. Thanks for the um, uh, the patience as we work through some of our technology pieces. Let me clear something up and uh, thank you for noticing at least now, Carl. So let's go back again, just to run through real quick. Um, Today's topic, coronavirus updates, social versus physical distancing, reinfection, is that really happening? Looking down the road, how do we manage this uh, uh, distancing, this isolation process one, two, three months from now? What are gonna, the next steps going to be? And then again, updates on ACE inhibitors, uh, in-home medical care during social isolation, virus testing, uh, chloroquine and hydrochloroquine and zinc. Again, I'm going to skip over the humor. Um, and again, this is where we left off just a second ago. We're not talking about social isolation here. We're talking about um, physical isolation. So again, as you start looking at the differences here, what generation more than the baby boomer generation can profit and needs uh, things like telemedicine, again, more than the baby boomer generation? 
it's we're also the generation that really struggles wrapping our head around seeing a doctor, uh, seeing a counselor, seeing um, uh, consultants online, going to church online. Uh, I, as I've continued to talk about things like that, I had one uh, one respondent say, "I'm not going to watch TV on church. That doesn't make sense. It's a social thing." And again. I agree 100%. We do need to start wrapping our heads around being able to access church, access others, access consultants, access physicians, access counselors through a more remote means. Because guess what? Our lives depend on it right now. So let's look down the road for a few minutes. Will the US be another Italy? I don't think so. Hopefully, I'm not just being an unrealistic optimist. Why do I not think that we're gonna be another Italy? A um, Couple of things. I mean, they, they had a couple of challenges. Number one, they had maybe a little bit more connection to uh, China, especially in Northern Italy than many people knew about until this all happened. The other thing is Italy got hit significantly earlier in this pandemic than the US. So hopefully we can and are learning uh, from lessons, uh, learned the hard way in terms of cost of lives in Italy and China. When will we know? I, so let's again start thinking about the details. And uh, as I've shared before, I've uh, been involved in outbreak uh, management in the past. I uh, was on the Maryland governor's uh, uh, AIDS, uh, HTLV3, HIV uh, outbreak uh, committee way back 30 years ago when that came out. I was on the uh, uh, another governor's uh, pandemic committee just a few years ago when, um, when we started worrying about pandemic flu. So again, I trained in Hopkins, used to teach this at Hopkins and uh, this is a passion of mine and thought I would share some of my thought processes as we go through, uh, again, looking down the road. Obviously this is unprecedented. Um, at least in our lifetimes. Uh, similar stuff may have happened uh, 100 years ago. And the epidemiologists, the guys that uh, do what I've done for a major part of my career have been talking for the past 10, 15 years about the next 100 year pandemic. Now, <clears throat> if you haven't read the um, the Spanish flu, go ahead and, and, and read that. You'll get, just like everything else, I've seen articles saying everybody's talking about the Spanish flu. It was nothing like this. That's not true. There were a lot of correlates. And one of the most important correlates is a story that not a lot of people have read yet, but it's a story about two different ways of reacting to requests for isolation. Uh, pan, uh, pandemic Spanish flu, 1918, Philadelphia versus St. Louis. St. Louis listened, had a few hundred deaths. Philadelphia didn't. In fact, they, can, they refused to call off a large parade. Uh, it's thousands of deaths. Again, very, very different um, reaction <clears throat> to news and requests to isolate and very different outcome in terms of people's lives. Uh, Janice is, my wife's um, family was touched personally. My family was touched as well, but on this uh, Philadelphia thing, her um, great grandmother actually had to, was a Dunkard, uh, one of the religious groups in, in Pennsylvania. For the first time ever had to leave her home to go pick up her son near Philadelphia who became infected with the Spanish flu. So let's go back to coronavirus and us in Italy, the US. Um, do, do we have effective isolation? Well, again, I think you've seen uh, some of it appears to be and some of it not so much. Just over the past uh, few days, we've had groups like the governor of Kentucky saying, okay, restaurants are shut down. Schools got shut down for the most part throughout the country, um, if my facts are correct, probably around uh, uh, over a rolling period last week. 
So a major uh, source of transmission, potential source of transmission there, restaurants, another source of transmission, other businesses, retails, uh, those have been, have been getting shut down over the past two weeks. I think if we start watching what's going on, I think we are cl as close to significant isolation as we're gonna be just starting over the past couple of days. Now, so what does that mean again, in terms of a, an epidemiologist thinking through this? Well, first of all, you have to know the incubation period. How long do people that have already been infected, even if they go home, how long is it gonna take them to start showing symptoms? The best information I can find right now is anywhere from three days to two weeks. And that's not uncommon at all for a virus. Um, these are biological systems. They, uh, some react quicker, some react slower. So it's probably gonna take us at least two weeks to figure out, okay, how effective have we been in terms of slowing down transmission? In terms of, again, uh, slowing down transmission. It's gonna take two to three weeks. And then let's fast forward to two to three weeks from now. So then it's gonna take another couple of weeks to start doing things like finding, okay, we had a significant uh, leak here, a leak there. We've got, and a leak would mean um, uh, many outbreaks or clusters of disease. So we'll be doing some things in terms of managing that. Meanwhile, there will be the uh, greatly increased uh, testing that'll go on. That testing will also help us understand the denominator. In other words, right now, what we're seeing is people with symptoms, we're seeing people that are dying, but we don't know how many people are infected. So this is gonna take some time. That's not gonna happen over the next week or two. It's gonna take at least two to three weeks and then another couple of weeks to start uh, managing uh, places where, where there's uh, clusters, ineffective decrease in transmission. So again, but though, let's say that we are successful at that point, and I, I clearly think we will be relative to where had this happened a month ago without any warning. What then? Does everybody stay at home and wait for a vaccine? Ah, no, obviously that, I don't think anybody would agree that that's what we need to do next. Um, so then, or, or if we're not gonna wait for a vaccine, what are we gonna wait for? Um, zinc, we think zinc is gonna uh, prevent this outbreak. Um, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. No, I don't think, you know, this is, so, that's sort of like the question that we have now with heart attack and stroke. Uh, don't wait till something happens and then try to treat yourself out of it. That's the wrong way to do it. Prevention is the best way to do it. So how do we prevent this? I hate to say this, and um, I haven't heard any public health or other leaders start to talk about this yet, but at some point we're going to have to go back out there. Now the question is going to become, how do we do that? How do we restart the economy? How do we develop herd immunity? I've heard, I've heard several people complain about, oh, now they're referring to us as cows. You know, we're not referring to each other as cows. And if, uh, if that's what, the way you want to translate that, um, then all I can say is moo. Um, here's the thing. We do need to, uh, at some point, an absent a vaccine, a, a miracle vaccine available within a month or so. Absent a vaccine, absent treatments that will help us prevent and avoid this. Uh, absent those things, we're gonna have to, uh, the most powerful tool is gonna be herd immunity. How do we develop herd immunity? Then we're gonna have to start figuring out, okay, who goes back out there first? Who's not susceptible? And more important, I think that part's going to be easy. It's going to be the 40 year olds and uh, the 40 year olds that do not have any other uh, risk factors like obesity, smoking, um, immune system problems. That part's easy. The next part is when and how, how much do these folks have any exposure or potential exposure to folks that have uh, risk factors? So again, for the vast majority of this channel, that is a, 
there's an easy way to go back and look and think about that. Over half of us are over 55 years old. Way over half of us have prediabetes and or risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, um, which clearly makes us at higher risk for coronavirus. So uh, most of us are probably going to be in the, in the very last wave that goes out there. Uh, for those of you who have a question, what is herd immunity? It, herd immunity is getting people who have been exposed to uh, a virus like this and are immune. Those people in a population or a herd are sort of like, uh, again, to use uh, Michael Osterholm's analogy, it's sort of like sticking the lead bars into a nuclear reactor. It slows things down. And again, one of the critical pieces that I didn't mention, but I have listed is we do want to keep this thing slowed down so we don't overrun ICU activities. So again, just some, uh, some thoughts from somebody who's been in some of these battles uh, before. So two to four weeks minimum confirmation that we've controlled spread. Much of the shutdowns just now occurring. Incubation period of three to 14 days, seven to 14 days to confirm uh, slowed spread. So uh, again, that's where you start getting up to about four weeks. Much longer to start capping off clusters. Another two to four weeks after that to assure us a, a potential for a safe re return, to start educating the public regarding how we need to return and to uh, verify that there's not gonna be any miracle uh, countermeasures like a miracle a vaccine, a, a, you know, miracle treatments that will uh, slow this down or stop it. Great efforts to confirm safe function in other places like China. You know, we are clearly getting a lot of information from China that they've slowed it down. I mean, a few days ago, they said they had eight new cases in one day. So here's the problem. It's what do we, China has given us a lot, well, has always given us a lot of data. What do you believe? Now, I did get a few comments uh, recently on one of the last videos. I think it was from Parker Reed. And I think Parker was saying, yeah, if I'm involved with, what, three to five plants in China, production facilities, and yes, they are back up to function. So <clears throat> again, that's gonna be a critical part, figuring out what's actually going on in China. Are they actually getting back up to speed? Are they doing it without uh, significant, um, uh, deaths, death rate. And again, if you start thinking along the lines that we're talking about, it's certainly possible you just got to figure out how to get the right waves, the right healthy people out there that have no exposure to people with risk factors. And again, once we figure all that out, assuming we do, there's going to be a lot of deliberation and education regarding how do we make these decisions? Who's, who do we know that's at risk and who's not at risk? And again, how do we know who's got contact with people at risk and who does not. So then we, we start getting into detail about how to go out, which functions. Health and public safety are already out. They're not going to, you know, the police force is not gonna say we can't go out. Uh, they're critical right now. The uh, hospitals, at least some of the hospitals for more chronic disease, yes, I'm sure they're shutting down. Uh, but emergency departments, ICUs, groups like that, they can't shut down now. So then the question is going to become who starts com coming back up online? Restaurants, retail, other high contact businesses, when do, they when do they go back online? Which ones remain remote? And then again, that question about, okay, there's going to be a lot of deliberation and questions about people wanting treatment. I understand there is clearly a, a point for treatment. I will be um, mentioning treatment uh, a little bit later uh, on review. I've already talked about ACE inhibitors, that huge uh, debate around those, around zinc, around chloroquines. Um, and here's the, another pro problem. This is gonna be a, involve a lot of decision-making and how do governments make their choice? Are they gonna slip back into partisan politics? Uh, which filter, excuse me, my nose is just itching like crazy. Which filters are going to be um, used? Are we going to be focused more on the economy? Are we going to be focused on uh, helping uh, the 20-somethings that are in uh, retail 
and losing their jobs, getting them back up to speed? Are we gonna be focusing on kids that depend on school to, uh, because they're, uh, they're homeless and school's one of their major anchors in their life? Or are we gonna be focusing and prioritizing spread of the disease? Again, a lot of difficult questions that are gonna have to be uh, dealt with as we go through this. A major concern and question keeps popping up and it has to do with reinfection. As you see from this headline on the right, coronavirus patient catches the bug a second time in two weeks after recovering. Now, that's not the first time I've seen that news. I saw a lot of those stories coming out of China. Um, now we're starting to see a couple of them coming out of Japan. That's totally uh, against the, uh, the key facts about coronavirus as listed and stated by the CDC. Fact number three that the CDC says is someone who has completed quarantine or has been released from isolation does not pose a risk of infection to other people. Well, obviously, is, if there is a significant reinfection process, um, that would not be true. So uh, I think it remains to be seen uh, whether the CDC fact number three is true or some of the headlines that we've seen is true and whether or not people can actually get reinfected. Um, there are uh, examples within the infectious disease world where people are somewhat, um, uh, what is it, uh, shingles. Shingles comes from a, a um, uh, one of the childhood diseases, um, uh, mumps, I think, having a senior mum, and I obviously should know that given what I've done all my life. But instead of totally clearing the virus uh, for shingles, the, pardon my scratching my nose again, instead of totally clearing the virus for shingles, what happens is that the, um, the virus is basically beaten down. It can and will live sometimes in the nerve ganglia. So, uh, and it can, if uh, the individual, as they get older, as they become immune compromised, uh, can come back out in nerve roots. So there are, there's certainly a possibility that that, something like that could be happening. Um, am I betting my money that that's going on? No, I don't think so. I, I clearly don't think it's something that's going on on a practical basis. If it were, that already would have come out, at least in my estimate. There's obviously been a lot of attention paid to this virus so far. And if there were a huge reinfection rate, uh, it would have made the, uh, made the news. So obviously more remains to be seen about that. Now, just to go back to some updates, a lot of people um, ha have been asking a lot of questions about uh, medications and I'll run through some of those real quick. One of them is the ACE inhibitors. Yes, the uh, virus does appear to use the ACE2 receptor to get into the cell. And what has happened is you see people on both sides of this debate. Some people saying, therefore, you cannot and should not use um, ACE inhibitors, one of the more popular uh, blood pressure medications. Uh, one theory is that ACE inhibitors increase um, cause the body to increase uh, ACE receptors. Another one is, no, you should use ACE inhibitors by preference. Um, what's the answer? What's the reality? I don't think we know for sure yet. Um, we do say uh, the, the most um, reliable group that I've seen is the uh, European Society of Cardiology and their hypertension group has looked at this and said, look, a, there's no real science behind this. Yes, Lancet has published a letter on this. It was not peer reviewed, uh, but there's no clinical science and there's no scientific evidence to suggest that treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be discontinued because of the COVID-19 infection. Now, uh, so as I usually do with my patients, I give the facts first and then have a very patient directed type of process. Uh, once the patients understand the facts, and I, I have the same perspective with my patients now, if you want to switch off your off of ACE inhibitors, we've used those a lot. They're far better for 
uh, managing uh, your risk with diabetes and or uh, heart disease. If you look at this information and say, well, I just wanna be off of ACE inhibitors. Sure, call Michelle, get set up with an appointment and I'll be happy to, uh, to talk with you about switching that. On the other hand, again, a lot of folks are saying, no, you're better off with ACE inhibitors. Bottom line is, so I've given you the facts. And then quite often after I give the patient the facts, the patient will say, well, doc, what do you do? I'm on ACE inhibitors. I'm on benazapril. I used to be on ramipril. And you may notice the pattern here. If it ends with, if it's a blood pressure medicine and ends with PRIL, it's probably one of the ACE inhibitors. Um, <clears throat> I'm on one. I was on ramipril until it got very difficult to get because of some uh, supply chain problems. Switched to benazapril. I'm on benazapril now. Um, have I switched? No. Do I plan to switch? No, not until we get more information out there. Here's one thing. We don't know about uh, the bottom line on the ACE inhibitors yet. We do know that if I go spend uh, an hour or two waiting in the, in the uh, pharmacy waiting room, that I'm risking my life. Well, you could say, well, no, you could do this by mail order. Again, I'm totally comfortable doing that with folks that want to. I'm not doing that yet myself. So that's a quick story on um, ACE inhibitors and coronavirus. Just an update on coronavirus testing. Yes, we are continuing to do, um, to look at setting up coronavirus testing across this country. Walgreens is looking to do it, uh, Walmart, uh, a couple of other folks, I think CVS, I'm working with a, uh, a national pharmacy and grocery group that's uh, looking to set this up as well. Uh, we plan to announce on Thursday of this week. So that would be what, tomorrow? Um, and then start pilot testing as of uh, Monday. Um, that by the way, is a big project. So you, one of the things that we all have to think about you first think, oh, okay, you know what? I want to get the testing. I'm going to drive over to my local grocery store and get tested. Uh, not quite so fast. Think about it. There is still limitation on the number of test kits available. Most places are saying they do need a doctor's order. I am providing some doctor's order for the group that I'm talking about. And the CDC has already set up criteria. First criteria is for people that are hospitalized. That's the first priority for for uh, coronavirus testing. The uh, second one is for healthcare personnel who are working with and caring for people that have known coronavirus disease. Then you get to the third one, and that is people with the risk factors that you've already heard about. A hundred times, a thousand times, you know, um, middle-aged, over 40, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, in other words, people that watch this channel, subscribers to this channel. I, I know I'm not supposed to scratch my nose, but it's sort of like somebody's tickling my nose just to create more challenge. So again, I've already covered this. And in fact, that's why we had the meeting, uh, this meeting today at 1030 rather than uh, the usual time at 11 because I'm meeting with some folks uh, in uh, our state government offices to, um, uh, to look at getting this uh, started up. Um, we've already talked about criteria, older, uh, the CDC criteria, older diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, immunocompromised, and of course the first two, hospitalized and healthcare workers. Zinc. Uh, again, people talk about, well, Brewer, we know that zinc's not going to keep this from happening. We know that those medications are not going to save us from this problem, but they still can be important. I would agree. I would agree 100%. Am I taking zinc? I can't. I've got some old zinc. I've always taken it. Uh, I'm running out. And am I going to try to get some more? Yes, I am. But there's been a run on zinc. Here's one of the things to think about, though. First of all, for the science geeks, why is zinc an issue? Well, coronavirus um, is dependent on an enzyme to get, uh, to get functioning within the cell. That enzyme, again, for the geeks, is called 
uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now, if I can remember, maybe we can have a pop quiz at the end of the, uh, the discussion about what was the name of that? It had RNA in it twice. The first one is RNA dependent, and then the second one is RNA polymerase. Poly polymerase. And again, I don't need to remember that, but it is needed. Now here's what happens. Zinc inhibits that disease, that uh, um, enzyme. We've known that for a while. This is uh, from PLOS pathogens. Zinc uh, inhibits coronavirus and arterivirus RNA polymerase in vitro and zinc ionophores block the replication. Those, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep it uh, scratching my nose because it's just driving me crazy. Um, those of you who keep up with the internet lore, there was a virologist who evidently sent something to his family telling him, take zinc, take zinc, because he had worked with coronavirus. Um, and that went viral. Uh, pardon the pun, no pun intended, sorry about that. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing though. It doesn't matter how high you get your zinc levels in your blood, zinc struggles to get into the cell. It, zinc is a, it's a, an ion, it's charged as you see here, zinc two plus positive. And the cell wall is a lipid or an oil type of, fat or oil type uh, based material. So ions don't go through uh, cell walls very well. They have to have a thing we call an ionophore. And what that does is the ionophore is a substance which is able, which uh, helps transport an ion across a membrane, cell membrane. So then we, we get to a new issue. What are the ionophores? What are, or do we know of any ionophores? It turns out, yes, we do. It's called chloroquine. It's an age old, decades old anti-malarial drug. And in fact, as you start looking around, we've already looked, that's already been looked at and there's already significant evidence that there's something even better than chloroquine. It's called hydroxychloroquine or otherwise known as Plaquenil. Plaquenil has been given to many people for a long time for things like, um, um, not rheumatoid, well, so I think some of the rheumatoid arthritis as well, but lupus, again, I was having some word, word finding problems. It's been given for lupus for a long time. Um, and so Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine does appear to help get that zinc ion across the, um, across the cell membrane. How well are these gonna work? That remains to be seen. But remember, you know, again, we've got several different things. First of all, this whole zinc theory has to work and there's, it's more than theory, there's scientific evidence behind it, but it has to work well. And then once, and then you've got to get the zinc. And again, there's been runs on zinc. And then you've got to get the zinc at a, an appropriate level within your bloodstream. So you got to take it. Then you've got to access the chloroquine or even more preferably the hydroxychloroquine. So again, as you see, these, uh, some of these supplement and medication best based uh, things, yes, they're helpful, but they can also be a house of cards. Let's step back and remember, there is one thing that doesn't cost, I mean, you don't have to go buy it. You can't put it, it's not, um, um, it's not being uh, taken up out of the grocery stores. It's not missing in the supply chain. And that is isolation. Go ahead and isolate. Isolation is the one thing that's available to all of us. And well, and again, I realize some people could argue if you're an ER doc, isolation may not be available to you, but it should be available to uh, most of the baby boomers, most of the folks that are watching this channel, focus on isolation. And yes, we'll get to zinc and chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and some of those other things uh, as soon as we are able to do that. So I have, uh, I've said this many times, um, 
guys, I'm open for seeing patients. I have limited, especially with some of the stuff that's going on with um, starting up the new testing programs. I have significant limitations on my time, but I've set aside a couple of time slots per week. Uh, now it's up to four, uh, three to four hour time slots in the afternoon, Eastern time uh, to see patients. But I can tell you, I am not uh, full. I'm not overloaded with patient care right now. And here's one of the major problems. You know, part of it is the reach of the channel. We're not a, a 2 million subscriber channel. We're only like 65,000 uh, folks. But the bigger part is I talk to people all the time, baby boomer generation. Well, you know, doc, I'd love to see you, but I live in Connecticut. Can't wrap your head around uh, remote care. Uh, I did, you'll see a couple of videos coming out uh, from me over the next uh, week or so where we talk about things like the electronic medical record, how this is actually a, a medical practice available to folks. E-prescribing, e-prescribing by the way, uh, became popular and critical to the medical systems long before um, uh, telemedicine. And it's because e-prescribing actually take uh, takes a huge whack out of by far the most common quality problem with uh, prescriptions. And guess what? The most quali common quality problem with prescriptions is doctor's handwriting. So there you go. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear that, doctor's handwriting has for a long time been the biggest problem with quality of prescriptions. Now let's go back and see uh, what we've got in terms of uh, participation. Well, we've got a lot of participation again today. Uh, Carl, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, set this up where the share has stopped. And I'm gonna go back into comments and see if we can deal with some of those. John Panazzo, good to talk to you, John. Hello, Dr. Brewer, good morning. You know, John, you had made a comment a couple of weeks ago about having been on a cruise, I think it was to Antarctica. Uh, I'm jealous, I would love to go on a cruise to Antarctica, but I had also said, uh, not right now. And I made the comment, I think it probably rubbed a lot of people the wrong way about cruises being a, um, a giant floating human Petri dish. Uh, pardon me for those of you that that offended. Um, I didn't get a lot of comments on that, but we did talk a good bit about, um, I do have an error in there. I did focus mostly on fomite or droplet transmission. I'm not going to get into the differences between fomite and droplet transmission, but I will say this, uh, it was aerosol. I mean, the one thing I didn't focus enough on, that was an error on my part, continuing to focus on aerosol transmission. Here's the critical piece. Um, this is aerosol uh, transmitted, and that means breathing the air. These particles can exist in the air for hours. And that's part of the problem, a big part of the problem. So our Russian friend, I don't know how to pronounce that. It looks like Raspin Bjornborn or something. I, part, I shouldn't have even tried your name, but he said, I love my te uh, telesartan. Telesartan, for those of you who don't know, is an ARB uh, ACE uh, receptor, angiotensin receptor blocker. It's one of those medications like ACE inhibitors, which are, are being debated right now in terms of, is it protect protective? Is it uh, increasing risk? Tell me, Sartan. Pedro Botello Leal. Hello from Lisbon. Uh, Pedro, thank you very much. I don't remember uh, clearly not having a commenter on, on one of the YouTube lives from Lisbon. One of the most fun times, one month or two month periods in my life, our lives, Janice and mine as a married couple, has been when we spent it in, um, in Portugal. We went to Coimbra in Portugal, nice little fun town, and then spent time in uh, Porto and tried some of that nice port there and in Lisbon as well and saw the, uh, the little zoo or the little town. They've got a town that was built 
uh, it's like a little, well, I won't go any, any deeper into that. It's gonna bore other people, but we love Portugal. Now we've got uh, Kiev, Ukraine here. So thank you again in the Cyrillic, is it Cyrillic script, Russian script? Thank you again for your comments and, uh, and identification. John Panazzo, Kiev and Lisbon, a, a warm welcome from Las Vegas. John, you had to rub that in, didn't you? John uh, lives close enough to, what is it, the Red Rock uh, Canyon? So some of the best hiking, rock climbing, uh, right there at his back door. Michael Frost, big thanks to you, Doc. I love your channel and appreciate a lot your live streams and updates with your robust medical perspective. Greetings from Vienna, Austria. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, in fact, my very first commenter four years ago was from Austria. I don't think he was from Vienna though. And I remember I was so excited to finally have a comment on the channel. Someone out there was listening. Um, from our uh, Ukrainian friend, Kievian? I don't know how do you, what are you if you're from Kiev? Kievian? Anyhow, Ukrainian friend. I hear that coronavirus doesn't appear to work like other viruses in terms of herd immunity development. I've heard some comments about that too. And obviously I am not believing that just yet. Uh, if there is a problem there, that's gonna be a whole different kettle of fish. And I think I did mention that, I'll mention it again. Thank you uh, again, our Ukrainian friend for bringing that up because maybe I un underemphasized that. That whole discussion about what to do next is based on the assumption that <clears throat> the CDC is right and that once you have this disease and you're over with, with it, you're not on a regular basis. Most people are not going to get reinfected. <clears throat> Pedro Botello, thank you, John Panazzo. Lolita, thank you for your work and support. Thank you very much for your recognition. I have to tell you, uh, when people say that, to be very honest, I'm having a blast. I, um, I obviously don't uh, enjoy seeing all the, the, the economy getting totally trashed, people's lives being lost, all the suffering. But here's the thing, I trained in this stuff. This is, uh, this is what I grew up doing. So um, I'm very excited about what's going on and very excited about the potential for uh, making a contribution. I could not be happier, at least in terms of my uh, career and what I'm doing from a legacy perspective. But thank you very much for your interest, especially, and for your recognition. Uh, I'm gonna have to jump off in just a couple of minutes. I'm gonna try to get through a few more comments before I do. Um, again, I have to, to uh, attend a meeting regarding the, uh, the, the upcoming national testing. Thank you for your work and support. Uh, Cheryl, I had to go out and pick up my medicine today, but I went through the drive-thru. Good for you. I'm spraying my mailbox with Lysol and my mail. Okay. James Cantor, you will not get it from mail. Um, Niall Function, hello doc, good stuff. Appreciate all your efforts. Niall, good to hear from you. I have to make this comment, it's a personal comment. Niall is like a world-class athlete. He has trained people to swim the English Channel. Uh, in terms of taking risk, uh, he's planning, I think it's this November or October, isn't it now? To do like what, a 30 mile swim out in the ocean near Hawaii, uh, near that place where the leper colony used to be, and um, a place where a whole bunch of great whites tend to swim. So good luck, Ni good luck Nile. Stay away from the uh, great whites when you're in the water and um, stay away from the um, coronavirus right now until you get there. Okay, John Tacho, Hong Kong flu, bird flu, swine flu, SARS, COVID. It's obvious that going forward, we need to stop the spread sooner at its source, need to isolate areas quicker. Thank you, John. Basic epidemic, pandemic management 101. And yes, you're right. We need to do better at that space. For those of you who have an interest, uh, the book by Michael uh, Osterholm, Deadliest enemy. It's a great book. Chapter 13. He called it 
He called it as going to be coronavirus. He called it as going to come out of China. It was all there. And here's, I mean, here's some other stuff he would say. We've had abilities to have, uh, to have worldwide production of this mask. Instead, we had production in just a few plants in what, Puerto Rico? That all, by the way, got wiped out by a hurricane at one point. I mean, it's just a set of warnings that we could have heeded. It was all over the, you know, it's been in Lancet and multiple other medical journals. The people that, that were able to stop SARS uh, in, um, was it SARS or MERS in, uh, in South Korea? The team that was instrumental in stopping that, I think it was the Samsung Medical Center, instrumental in slowing that down, presented very clearly, guys, there are things that we can do to, um, to focus on this and prevent some of this happening in the future. But we can prepare for war. We just haven't figured, well, we can prepare for war with other humans. We just haven't figured out yet how to prepare how we need to focus our resources on preparing for war with viruses and infectious diseases. Got to make one more comment coming out of that book, and it's a very, very good comment. One of the wars that's coming up that uh, we're not even focusing on is um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. According to Osterholm, and again, he's a great, he's as qualified as anybody I know of in this space. According to him, it's a far bigger issue than something like uh, coronavirus in terms of deaths. So again, some things to think about. So Richard Long, regarding mail, a letter new, uh, to New England Journal yesterday showed data from testing cardboard. It's measurable for days on cardboard. Cardboard is paper. Mail handled by people could be a carrier. Uh, Bill Courtney, chicken pox, chicken pox, chicken pox, zoster. I'm not sure where all the chicken pox is coming from here. Um, Farouk Farr. Farouk Farr is one of our uh, uh, common presenters. Farouk has, a, I think, a medical background. I don't know, if, Farouk, if you're a doc or a medical student, but right there in Iran. Major, major hotbed of uh, death and devastation with, uh, with this disease. Dear Dr. Brewer, do you think the vaccine could be developed before the virus wipes us out in Iran? I heard 12 to 16 months will take. Why so long? It's a good point, and I covered that in the past. We've made huge progress in terms of the virus. And in fact, there was news. Um, there was a picture on it. It was in a lab in San Diego, and Francis Collins who's the head of NIH and uh, Donald Trump, who's the president of the United States, were standing there being briefed by some people in a lab in San Diego who have already done not only the uh, genetic code for the coronavirus, but then next developed the amino acid sequence for a protein which could or should be used for uh, virus testing or for uh, vaccine testing. So theoretically, if we had production facilities located all over the world that could produce um, uh, these protein, these amino acid sequences, they could just email it, literally. I read about this a while back, it's so interesting. Uh, they could just email the amino acid sequence to the these globally uh, located production facilities and make it. Now, why is that not happening? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, we don't have global uh, distribution of, um, um, of uh, vaccine production facilities. Uh, you know, a lot of them, are, I, for all I know, a lot of them are still using the old fashioned eggs. Um, number two, there's, a, there's another issue as well, and that has to do with testing. How do we know that that uh, amino acid sequence that they developed in uh, the San Diego lab is not going to cause something maybe even worse in terms of reactions. We've had that in the past. There was a debacle. Oh, what was the? What was that? Something ended up um, causing severe um, neurological disease with one of the the flu epidemics. Gosh, what back in the eighties? Somebody help me with the facts. And you'll have to look it up quickly because I'm going to have to drop in just a minute. 
Um, our Ukrainian friend, I always thought my Telmasartan would be productive, dot, dot, dot. Michael Frost, for far, I think that a German med company has already developed a vaccine and it started testing in phase one. They believe it may be ready for public by autumn. Richard Lund, Vincent Rasaniello from Colombia says we'll never completely clear viruses once they infect us. He has a great course available on YouTube on viruses done this year. And again, that's not at all uncommon, Richard. There are some viruses which we don't completely clear. And that's certainly a possibility with this one. John Panazzo, everyone, if you appreciate Dr. Brewer's videos, please consider smashing a oh, Thank you so much, John. Yes, I, I tell you, I, I get a lot of great reviews, but I'm not so good at marketing this stuff. Um, and marketing has this tinge of money grabbing and stuff like that. I don't agree with that. I actually got about halfway through a, an MBA at NYU 30, 25 years ago. And marketing, actually, I was ahead of my time. I was focused on marketing at uh, Hopkins back when people thought it was more money grubbing type stuff. My daughter just went to, um, uh, got her MPH a couple of years ago at Tulane. Marketing is now a core curriculum product for public health people because marketing is basically getting your information out to people. Now, despite all that discussion, <laughs> I'm not very good at it. Uh, it is what it is. I am what I am. Uh, thank you very much, John, for that mention. Uh, Gigi, good to hear from you. Human trials are being conducted as we speak in the state of Washington. The possible vaccine was developed in only 65 days. That's a heck of a lot faster than we've done this in the past. And yes, I am hopeful. We are, I'm a, speaking of hopeful, I am hopeful. I think that, again, we're going to manage this far better than we could have. I started to go into um, the comparison. Well, I think I did go into the comparison of uh, St. Louis versus Philadelphia. And I think the US is gonna be a St. Louis. Um, maybe China was more of a Philadelphia. Maybe they ignored it too long and a lot of people died as a result. But, you know, they got hit first. Um, not gonna start getting into criticisms of other governments and other, other groups. Uh, I will notice, mention this. You notice I'm wearing my white coat these days, and I'm wearing that white coat to just give you a gentle reminder that guys, yeah, you're, you're isolated, you're not able to maybe get out that much, but there's care available and it's clearly not taken up yet. So, okay, Chero, I have COPD, uh, our Ukrainian friend, last resort and all. Uh, Vladimir Radata, of course, also me. I'm not sure what that means, Vladimir, but that's a very Russian sounding name. Uh, Tom Goodlett, is quercetin and ionophore for zinc? That's a good question, Tom. I keep meaning, I did some, some brief work on quercetin and I don't remember yet. I think you may be right. Really, really good question. Um, Laulita, I'm from Bucharest, Romania. Laulita, I don't, thank you very much for making us aware and I do not think I've heard from anybody, comment or otherwise, from Romania yet. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting times Janice and I had was in Budapest, and I know they're not the same town, but I'm from Bucharest, Romania, and thank you again for, making, for taking care of us, even we are thousands of miles away. Thank you very much, for Lalita. I do appreciate that recognition. Take care of you and all the health in the world for you and your family. Thank you. Well, I will tell you this, all of the health in the world, the guys got really excited last weekend and called me up and said, okay, we're gonna have a startup meeting on, uh, on Saturday, we need you in Louisville and we're all gonna meet there. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I know we're all excited about getting testing available for folks, but let me back up before we get too excited and ask you a couple of questions. I'm 62 years old, I've got prediabetes, I've got atrial fib, so I've got definition, you know, prediabetes, heart disease. Uh, older than age 50, older than 60. I'm one of those risk people. My wife has the same risks. We're on isolation. Tell me, as exciting as this process may be of setting up, potentially setting up national testing, why it needs to risk my life to go there and my wife's life as well, because I live with her and I'll come home to her. And they went, 
there was just a pause. And then immediately that after that pause, they said, there's absolutely no reason we're gonna do this remotely. So guys, again, there's a purpose behind that story where the baby boomers were not used to, to social interaction remotely. It will save our lives right now. I need to, I need to get off. I've got another couple of minutes. Let me just see if I can, if there's anything else I need to cover real quick. Hi, uh, Pavlov Papanakalu. Um, I think that's the same name as the pap smear, isn't it? Papanakalu smear. Uh, hi, doctor from London, UK. Dr. Brewer wanted to ask about sufferers of allergic rhinitis and sinusitis. Is this considered a major risk factor? Uh, I have not ever heard that rhinitis or allergies were. Uh, Dr. Ronald K. Powell. You must be a doc. Doc, are you still taking a statin drug along with your ACE inhibitor? Yes, I am. I'm taking, um, I about six months ago, switched from Crestor five milligrams, then down to two milligrams, and then two and a half milligrams twice a week. And then, then I switched again about six months ago to Lavalo or Patavastatin. Patavastatin is the only uh, statin which actually uh, appears to improve insulin, insulin resistance. The other ones sort of push you down that road. So it's a risk benefit issue. And in the US, actually, most of us used to have to get it through uh, 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 Canada, Canada Pharmacy online. Uh, now, a lot of the insurance companies are covering patavastatin at a reasonable copay. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, guys. I'm going to have to jump off and prepare for the 1130 Eastern Time meeting. And hopefully we'll be successful at uh, getting through all the things we have to get through to get uh, some more testing available for folks in the US at least. Thanks for your interest.